In this video, I'll discuss the statistical properties of returns. We define returns as random variables, and therefore, we can use statistics to predict stock returns. I'll define the risk associated with the returns and how we measure it. So, since we're going to define a return as a random variable, let's first define a random variable. A random variable is a variable whose set of possible values are characterized by a predetermined set of probabilities. Such probabilities are said to form a probability distribution. We can analyze that probability distribution and use it to make assumptions about the future values of the random variable. The problem we face when we're using random variables in the real world is that we first have to determine the probability distribution before we can predict future values of the random variable. For example, does this random variable follow a binomial distribution like the flip of a coin, or a normal distribution like the grades on a test? We'll determine the probability distribution of the random variable based on the historical sample data we have, but we won't ever have the entire population of data. Alright, let's go ahead and discuss the properties of returns, which we are assuming are random variables. First, we'll want to know the expected return or mean return. One of the ways we can get that is by calculating the probability of each possible return a security could have for a given state, S, and multiplying that probability by the return in that state, R sub S. And then we'll sum up all those probabilities times their returns. This left-hand side here, this is our symbol for expected return. So our expected return in this case is just the sum of all the probabilities of each state occurring times the returns in those states. Now notice here that we have to ensure that the probability of all states sums to 1. If it doesn't, well, we've got some issues. All right, let's go through an example really quickly to illustrate this. So you've performed scenario analysis and you've determined the, the possible returns and likelihoods of each return for a particular stock. We have really four states here. A good state, a neutral state, a bad state, and a fire sale state where everybody's trying to sell. Everything must go. And we have returns that correspond with, with each state, and we have the probability associated with each state of the economy occurring in the next year. So, what is the expected return for this stock? Well, I'm going to move over to Excel and work that there, just so you can see it a little more easily. Alright, so here we go. Same data here. Now what we want to do is we want to calculate our expected return. Remember, that's just the sum of each of these products of probabilities times the return. So to get that, I'm going to use, I'm going to take the probability of the good state occurring, multiply it by the return in that state, add to that the probability of the second state occurring, and multiply that by the return, and then do the same for the last two states. And so our expected return in this case is negative 3.6%. All right, so that took a while. I mean, here we only had four states of the economy, but it could be the case that we have more states of the potential economy. So there's actually a way to speed this up, and it's the sum product function. Now, the sum product function does exactly what I just did, but all you have to do is highlight the two columns that are going to be multiplied by each other and Excel will sum up all of those products. So sum product. And each of these columns is referred to as an array. So our first array is the returns. Our second array is the probabilities. And we will hit enter. And we get the same result. So the sum product function is a great way to save yourself some time when you're using Excel. Now let's talk about risk. Risk is the uncertainty of the return on an investment. As investors, we want to reduce risk while maximizing our expected return. The problem is that there's usually a positive relationship between risk and return. In many cases, the assets that offer the highest expected return have the highest risk. One of the ways that we express the positive relationship between risk and return is through the risk premium. 
Now, the risk premium, which we'll discuss in much greater detail in later videos, is the additional return an investor requires on a risky investment to compensate for the increased risk. Now, what kind of risks do you face as an investor if you're investing in a company? Well, there's all kinds of risks out there. Let's start off with business risk. Business risk is just the uncertainty around dividend payments, quarterly earnings, basically anything the business does. Next, we have financial risk. Now, financial risk is the risk that the firm will be unable to repay its creditors. In other words, if the firm has borrowed a large amount of money and every few months, or let's say every month, it owes some payment to its the bank that gave it a revolving loan, then if this firm can't repay that money or meet their, their regular monthly payment, they're going to be in technical default. And at that point, it goes to the bankruptcy court. So financial risk refers to the risk that the firm actually fails to repay what it owes to its creditor or creditors. Next, we have interest rate risk. And interest rate risk is the risk that changes in interest rates will adversely affect a security's value. Now, we normally see high amounts of interest rate risk in specific sectors of the economy, namely the financial sector and the real estate sector, which you can probably see why. I mean, firms in the financial sector, a lot of them are banks, and banks are heavily dependent on interest. Uh, they're loaning out money and they expect a certain interest rate. So if interest rates fall, that could be very bad for them. Now, real estate firms tend to do very well when interest rates are very low. The reason being that more potential borrowers will be able to get a low interest mortgage. So there's more demand for houses or some other property. It's, it's just better for the real estate industry as a whole. Next, we have liquidity risk. Liquidity risk is the risk of not being able to sell or liquidate an investment quickly without reducing its price. Investment companies are heavily exposed to this type of risk. Firms will also exhibit all kinds of event risk, which is the risk of some new information affecting the price of a security. So it could be a quarterly earnings announcement or the firm is significantly underperforming expectations of analysts. All right, the final risk I'll mention here is easily the most important, and that's market risk. Now, market risk is the risk that investment returns will decline because of factors that affect the broader economy, not just one company or one investment. For example, if there's a coronavirus outbreak, every stock in the economy will be affected because they all operate in the U.S. economy. In our future videos, we'll start to focus heavily on measuring this market risk. Now, let's talk about how we measure risk in the real world. The most common measures of risk are the variance and the standard deviation of returns. So, you should remember these from your statistics class. This sigma squared is our notation for variance, so this would be the variance of the return. And if we wanted to calculate that using some data, all we would need to do is first calculate the expected return, and then for each observation, subtract the expected return from the actual return, square those differences, and then multiply those differences by the probability with which they occurred. So that's illustrated here. Essentially, we're just taking the return in each state of the economy, minus the expected return, squaring it, multiplying it by the probability of each state of the economy. Now, the standard deviation, which we'll also refer to as volatility, is just the square root of the variance. So, sigma is just going to be our notation for standard deviation. Uh, now, I, I will say this again because I'll, I'll, I'll regularly use volatility as a reference to standard deviation. Volatility in investments is just the same thing as standard deviation. Now, there are some other formulas for variance. Let's talk about them. So, you probably remember from your statistics class that there are really two forms of variance. You have population variance and sample variance. Well, the, form, the formula we're going to use in this class is going to be sample variance. And the reason we're going to use sample variance is because in finance, we use a sample of data. I mean, if we're looking at the returns of a company, 
we might be looking at five years worth of monthly returns for Apple, for example. Well, the problem there is that we're only looking at a sample of the data and not the population of all possible returns. So what I'm trying to get at here is because investments is an empirical discipline and we're only using a, a small portion of the data that we could have if conditions were ideal and we had perfect information, we're forced to use the sample variance and the sample standard deviation. So just be aware of that as we go forward when we start to calculate volatility of a security over time. We're going to be using the sample standard deviation and the sample variance. With a large enough data set, that really won't be too different from the population variance. All right, finally, I need to mention a few additional formulas related to variance. We're going to use some of these properties a little more than some of these others, but you should... Hopefully, this should just be a refresher. So first off, we have the variance of a constant A plus the return on stock 1. In that case, the variance of A plus R1 is just going to be the, the variance of the return. The constant being added doesn't affect the volatility of the stock. In other words, you're just kind of shifting it upward or downward by the value of the constant. Next, we have the variance of a constant A times the return. And in that case, we just take the constant outside the variance and square it. So variance of A R1 becomes A squared variance of R1. Next, we have the variance of A plus B times R1. And in that case, the second rule applies again. The constant doesn't matter. It's just shifting our values upward or downward. But this second constant, b, we take it to the outside of the variance formula and square it. So this entire thing becomes b squared times the variance of r1. More or less the same thing when we try to take the standard deviation of a plus b times r1. Uh, just like with the variance, the constant a is just shifting the, the values upward or downward by the same amount. So that doesn't matter. But when we take b to the outside, now we're not squaring it. Essentially, this will just become b times standard deviation. All right, now let's talk about how we scale volatility and returns over longer and shorter periods of time. Let's start up here in this first bullet point. We can scale any daily volatility over any longer period of time we want. All we have to do is first identify our daily volatility just our standard deviation based on daily values, and then multiply that by the square root of the number of days over which we're scaling. So for example, if we wanted to scale up from a daily volatility number to an annual volatility number, we're scaling that by the square root of the number of trading days in a year. Now, one thing I should point out in the second bullet point is why we're using 252 instead of 365. To get from daily volatility to annual volatility, we're multiplying our daily volatility by the square root of 252, not 365. The reason we use 252 is because of this third bullet point. There are 252 trading days in a year. So all we do is just take standard deviation times square root of 252, that'll get us our annual standard deviation. Now, when we want to scale up a daily return, we do the same thing using the time value of money formula. Essentially, we're going to take 1 plus our daily return to the power of 252, because again, 252 trading days, subtract 1 to get rid of the principal, and now we have our annualized return. Now, we can also do the same thing with volatility. So this part right here, this is the annual volatility, sigma squared, is equal to 252 times the daily variance. So this thing right here just says that annual variance, sigma squared, is equal to 252 times daily variance. Now finally, you might be wondering how do we go from, say, a daily volatility or a daily variance or a daily return to a monthly return? Well, in that case, we just scale up by 21, since it's generally considered that there's 21 trading days in a month. All right, let's go through a CFA question. 
The mean daily return and daily volatility of a stock are four basis points and 3.21%. What are the mean annual return and volatility of this stock? All right, first off, let's get our annual return. We're just gonna take our daily return of four basis points and plug that in here, and we'll solve for our annual return. So four basis points is four hundredths of a percent, and we should get that our annual return is 10.6%, very simple. Next, let's scale up our daily volatility into annual volatility. So remember, we're just taking our daily volatility times the square root of the number of days over which we're scaling. So in this case, that's 252. So that gives us an annual volatility of 0.5096 or 50.96. Now there is, as a side note, a bit of disagreement on how you actually say volatility numbers. There's a lot of people that will say you, you just report a percentage like I have here, but there's also some people, I think those are more actuarially inclined that say you should just use the, the decimal. Uh, it's, it's kind of a toss up. Really, you can just report volatility as either, although I'd recommend uh, starting out, just report it as a percentage. All right, let's go ahead and recap. So returns are random variables and they follow a probability distribution. We're gonna talk about what probability distribution they follow here on the next video. Next, risk is measured as the standard deviation of returns, also known as volatility. Finally, we can scale returns and standard deviations across longer or shorter time periods. We can go from a day to a month to a year or even longer periods. All right, with that, I'm going to wrap up, and if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. I'll see you on the next video.